Welcome to the Startup Grind. So, Shafi, English. Um, all right. okay. um, so thank you very much for having me. Did you show you can see me from there? I can't see everyone because of the phone. Um, you can approach it. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. This is Tommy Ho. I come here very often. Thank you very much, Nada. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so um, much. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm very blessed to be here. Thank you. Yes, yeah. it's my uh, first. I would, th I would to thank you because you helped us to have the space here to have our interview today. Thank you so much for helping in every way. So, if you want to start, let's go to the beginning. Can you talk to us about your, uh, your when you were a kid and how you lived here in Medina? How uh, have you learned about uh, craft? Craft art. No, it's craft art. Craft. 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 About craft when you were a kid or when you grow up? When did you learn it first time? Okay, so uh, I have four brothers, and the tradition is your father should pass down the craft to your to his to his, uh, to his sons. So he tried it with four of them. Two of them became professional craftsmen, but it didn't work at the end with the four of them. And I was the only one who was not trained when I was a child for several reasons. Uh, the main reason was because in 1997, Morocco signed a convention with UNICEF calling apprenticeship in kids you know, child labor. So it was very illegal for even parents to teach their kids back in the 90s. Um, um, the other reason is because my father felt helpless uh, when he trained my brothers and didn't do it professionally. So he just thought, I shouldn't do it and I should do something else. So I did school and everything. Um, so I, but I would go always to my father's studio and I would remember kids uh, learning the craft and I would remember my uncles and cousins working in the same trade. Um, we, we had a family business that was established in 1968 and it used to produce what we call it Derija and Mihoj. Mihoj is a collection of about 13 items made of brass and silver, simply from Moroccan stenectin. It includes Darat Swani and Marash and Yakama and it's whole list just to make tea. When the tea ceremony was a very strong culture. Um, nowadays because of uh, the gas bottle and new you know, small kitchens, you can't fit many of those uh, items so, uh, from the house. Um, um, hence, I, I did my formal education in Morocco and I did my master's on Moroccan culture. At the same time, I did uh, study social entrepreneurship and I was active in both fields. And one day, which is about seven years ago, I decided to learn the craft from my father. Um, I did my master's research on the history of crafts and I just realized that um, we don't have the current generation that in the craft because the knowledge transfer is being cut because of legal and political uh, conventions. And so I, you know, having in mind social entrepreneurship, I thought I could start a small business that could keep the knowledge transfer happening. Um, and I thought of craft drafts. And craft drafts translates to Derija as Snaaga. So you just, um, in the past, the, the apprenticeship process would take about 10 years. Um, nobody has 10 years, 10 free years. So I just thought if I can offer something in four hours, people would, would be interested to do it. And that's. It took me about, you know, it took me a couple of years to find out the method. But I'll elaborate on that more. I don't know what's the other question. I don't know what it is. But can you tell us why uh, craft? Why, why you are, uh, are you interested in the craft? And what is the opportunity that you see in the markets? Because now everybody says, say, uh, we have many problems, it's not working anymore, we have like uh, Chinese who are coming here. Make sure I pass it to my kids. Uh, and then number two is in the <laughs> number two is uh, 
in the field of social entrepreneurship, of course, the principle is very easy. It's just you look at the problem as a as a as a business opportunity. This is the simple equation in social entrepreneurship. But in general, in social entrepreneurship around the world, you never find traditional problems considered social problems for social entrepreneurs to you know, to consider um, when they do their their, their stuff. And in my experience, for about six years in Morocco, I, I discovered that most of the so Moroccan social entrepreneurs I know myself didn't produce any innovation in the field of handicrafts. Most of their problems have to do with post-colonial problems, like problems related to education, women rights, um, children's rights, and education in general, like that, which are beautiful post-colonial problems. I mean, we could say that they are also pre-colonial problems. Um, but no one ever thought of introducing anything in relation to crafts and traditional, uh, traditional life of Morocco. And I, and, I, and I realized that in most craft businesses, there were three elements. One, you train the kids. Two, you produce and three, you sell. Um, and in this modern time, most of, the, most of the energy in the crafts would have to do with um, production and selling, production and selling. Even my friends who are social entrepreneurs in traditional factories, they would introduce marketing techniques for craftsmen to sell their, 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 their items. And I just thought that there is one part which is missing, the first element, which is the knowledge transfer. The reason why we could, we could enjoy this beautiful place uh, is because it was, it's the work of generation after generation. Uh, just to produce that little piece of tile, it took about a thousand years. Um, so the question is what's happening to the crash and who's going to be the next generation? Um, of course, I'm not assuming my workshop would produce professional craftsmen. What I'm, what I'm assuming I'm doing is um, keeping the knowledge transfer happening through workshops, sharing the, uh, the knowledge and connecting the world with craftsmen. If not craftsmen themselves, at least with, with crafts itself. So this is the... Can you talk to us more about the ecosystem, the ecosystem of artisanal uh, uh, crafts? Uh, what is missing? What are the parts that you think will go on uh, in the next years? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer in general. I'll give you a, a little analogy so you can understand what I'm going to say. Um, together, we're all in the same age. Um, same generation, if you want to buy a phone, you know Casera Dens, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to Casera Dens, you want to buy a phone. When you enter the place, you're not going to be saying, I want to buy a phone. You're going to be very specific. You're going to be saying, I want, for example, I don't want to do promotion, but you want to say iPhone S5, iPhone 10 or something. You're very specific. And the man in the shop will pick the phone and give that to you. Back in the time, um, at least in the 80s, when people wanted to buy a slipper or a gelava or a tray or anything related to crafts, when they go to the Medina and they ask them, someone who sells them, they were going to be very specific. For example, they go for bread, they were going to be saying something like Bret bread, Mkhalfa, Bildi, Mustamel, Zwaqaddama. When you say, for example, these five things, they know what you're talking about. It's exactly when you say iPhone S5. You're not going to step in the place and say, I want a phone. It's too vague. It's the same for crafts. The problem, the first problem I would say is, my generation were so disconnected with the crafts, and I'm 100% sure when you want to buy a slipper, you say slipper. When you want to buy a blaha, you just go and say, I want to buy a blaha. But it's a whole list of varieties in, in, in the blaha itself. <laughs> Let alone the jilaba, the tapush, all the, all the exclusion items. Um, so the ecosystem tells you that the current generation is disconnected. Therefore, you can't sell them something specific. You can only sell them. Uh, you can sell them something in general. You could say um, um, you could you could promote crafts, but you will never be able to revive the old audience that knew exactly what was done. So when I'm when I do my workshops and lectures, what I'm trying to say is. Um, just introduce a little bit of those terms, so if you happen to buy something in the Medina, you'll be able to use the right terms. Um, not something too great. Um, but again, the, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole problem would ha have to do with uh, knowledge transfer. Because you're not using those techniques.
who tells what you want to buy, tradition of craft, that means the knowledge trough has even reach it. Um, so there are two types of knowledge trough. Knowledge, you could say knowledge to the general public and knowledge to the specific audience, which are the apprentices. Mm -hmm. So we're not producing people your age who can produce, and we're not producing people your age who can buy them. You're likely to buy them, uh, of course, but you would never use the term. For me, using the term is um, very important, because um, that helps the... Uh, you know what to buy. Yeah, yeah. 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 did I answer your question? Uh, yes, partly, but I would like to, if you can tell me that more about uh, the craft last time when we were, were talking, uh, when we met last time, you talked to me about the problem with to, the tools. Now we have some, uh, how we can call it, skills or crafts that are still go, going, but uh, what is before it, before them? The tools, they are dying. Like, uh, I don't remember exactly the name, but uh, sparring is something that now we are using somewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us more about this? What are uh, the crafts that we are using? Okay, um, let me say two things. One, what is how are crafts organized in the Medina? And two, um, what's the hierarchy of crafts left? Um, so we have what we call it in Arabic, or in the region, Alhamta. Alhamta is the guild house of the craftsman. And it begins with an apprentice, in Tzalmik, to a craftsman, Ismail, to a master, Ismail, to head of the guild, Lamin, to the provost, Muhtasi, or Muhtasim. Um, when, you, when you start at five, when, when you're five years old or nine years old, you start as an apprentice and it takes you about eight to ten years to learn um, how to finish this, you know, one item. Um, of course, among other items. Um, so this is number one, is the Hanta is the most important thing. Uh, without this organization, we won't be able to organize craftsmen. And we still have the Hanta active to nowadays. Every craft will have its own guild, and all guilds uh, will have one provost to control them. But of course, every guild will have its own head of guild. Um, the craftsmen are organized in this way. You can think of it, of it this way. Um, it's, um, it's a chain of people helping each other. Um, we're having tool makers, then we're having finishers, and we're having people who do the actual job. For example, This is this is this is an actual item. It's half finished. Um, for me to be able to do this, I need someone to make me these. So tool makers make tools for me to be able to make this. Tool makers themselves have someone behind them, or also tool makers will make tools for them to make tools for me to to be able to finish the product. So to make a compass, I need a blacksmith, and the blacksmith to make a compass. He needs um, pillows, ikir, like a rabuz, to, you know, to put fire on. Um, so he doesn't know how to make ikir, so he needs someone else to make ikir for him. Um, and he forges iron into this. And I will never be able to make this because I'm no blacksmith. So without the blacksmith, I won't be able to make this. So it's a whole chain. When I finish my work, I give it to someone who's called muqaf. Um, who raises the edges of the tray. You've seen senior uh, raised right? Someone who uses a wooden mallet, just give it. Um, so, I remember I met some of the craftsmen, for example, I met a bookbinder, someone who would make, make books like these. Um, and I asked him, why aren't you binding books anymore? And he told me, my tool makers passed away. And then I realized that when tool makers pass away, we won't be able to make anything. And if you happen to be in a position where you could preserve crafts, I would say dedicate some large amount of money for tool makers, because without tool makers, nothing would happen. You enjoy the leash, right? But there's a blacksmith who makes the lokash, um, the little chisel, to make it. If that passes away, we won't be able to make the leash anymore. Um, it's a whole chain, it's very interwoven. Everyone is. Uh, uh, yeah, please join us. There are seats here. Yeah, so, so yeah, so remember the guild house? Remember the, the, the chain of the, of the craftsmen? It's an interview. Um, 
Um, in my workshops, people break my tools, my compasses and everything. One of them did the workshop, she didn't break it. Uh, but people would break my tools and I have to make them again every then and now. And the tool makers will always surprise. What? Because when they make a tool for you, the tool is supposed to survive forever. Um, this compass in my hand is at least, at least 60 years old. Um, and it's, it can leave another hand in 60 years. Uh, I guess. But in my watch, I think of people have no experience and not professional crafts and they break them. Hence, I'm very happy to have blacksmiths and tool makers making tools for the scratch again. And, um, I know I shouldn't be doing that, but, but tool makers are passing away. Um, if you happen to be in Hedadin, which is not far from myself, you'll be able to see the tool makers. Um, they are the people behind all the crafts, I would say. So, it's like a, you know, when you watch a movie, there is a, a credit. It tells you the director, the one who really cleaned the glass and everything. Um, the credit in crafts, exactly what I told you, the tool makers. Even for me to, uh, to do book binding, I need beeswax to uh, wax the thread before I do the stitching. So the bee is also contribution to the craft. It's a whole chain of humans, animals, trees, nature, in actually producing one one would like to. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, can you talk to us about craft drops? What do you think? All right, so craft crab drops is... Um, okay, before I say that, I would love to hear, I'm not sure if people heard of craft drop, I'll be very curious to know if someone in the room ever heard of craft drop and what, what do you think of craft drops? To see if I have a good image of the one. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I think it's a little studio where you... Uh, this is what you, you did say like uh, a few minutes. It's about um, learning how to craft, to make some crafts. <laughs> right here. Uh, and it's you to help people to do it. And I think you have uh, usually uh, it's um, uh, non Moroccan people because uh, they, they don't know very well your. Uh, to do. I think this is what I see where uh, where I saw the, the pictures in your uh, Facebook uh, page. Oh, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> By the way. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Just I'm just curious to know what people, what people know about craft job. I mean, I'm not seeing craft job in Google. But I'm just that would help me understand if I have reached the people in the Alright, so yeah, what? Yeah, go. Um, it's almost the same idea as what she says. Uh, uh, what I perceive is that you mostly work with tourists, and the idea that I have is that uh, you help them create a product and take them home with them uh, instead of just buying something ready. Mm -hmm. In this way, it's more precious to them because they made it for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, um, do you want to go ahead and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Alright, so. so the crowd draft motto is everyone is an artisan because I believe everyone is an artisan, everyone makes their hands. The moment you learn how to write, that's a craft because calligraphy is a craft. Except that your writing is not that sophisticated as calligraphy's writing. But still you're doing a craft. You use your hands. Um, but crowd draft um, um, is a multidisciplinary art studio and I, that offers um, traditional arts and crafts. Um, mostly visual arts and crafts uh, workshop to all age groups, to everyone, everywhere. So I'm not promoting it to tourists, I'm not promoting it to Moroccans, I'm promoting it to anybody who is interested in making something from scratch. Um, and I can tell you why I have more tourists than why I'm not having more tourists. Um, I, I brought here some of the things I, I, I teach, um, just to show you. Um, everything I do, is related to these two tools. We call them the Nija Dabudun Stop. The Dabud comes from Dabut, the one that you know, mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. perfects things. Um, uh, in the past, kids, um, while well, well, they were learning the, the trade, before they're allowed to apply any visual um, art to any item, be it zillage, uh, wood, plaster, uh, brass, leather, anything, they need to master these two tools. Without them, you won't be able to, be, to do anything. Um, unfortunately, in modern craft education, we're not teaching them these things. 
Um, but in my workshops, I'm very strict, I'm very traditional, very culturalist. I focus on the culture. Everyone who does a workshop with me would need to use these two tools to achieve something. Um, I teach brass etching, um, it's basically I teach you how to draw the pattern using the compass in the room. And I have tools. Um, I have about 1,300 of tools. Those little stamps. Um, and almost every stamp has its own name. And all the names are very interesting and funny. Including uh, Shisha, Adam Zitun, Karakora, and lots of things. So hopefully I'll be preparing a little glossary one day for all these uh, beautiful names. Yeah, so that's number one. So in, uh, in between three hours to four hours, you can make something like this yourself. Uh, you in here. Uh, and I've, I've, I've done this workshop with about 2,000 people so far. Um, and I've seen um, that it's impossible, it's possible that people can, can make this. Um, so this is, uh, this is what I teach book binding, this type of binding. Um, with the uh, Zwa on leather in Boston. Later on, you're welcome to come and touch and see them. Um, and I do other types of binding um, with cord stitching in here. Um, so I don't teach these. Um, my workshops are usually about these things because they're quite fast. This one's a good glue, so it takes about three to one, three days to one week to make one book. But in my workshops, you can make these in three hours. Um, make your own book and write it yourself. I teach an old craft that passed away, half of a making diet, as simple as that, making paper from scratch, so this is handmade paper. Um, uh, I have an apprentice, he's, uh, he's, in a friend, he's a French boy, but he's very Moroccan, he speaks that region and he lives in Morocco. And he is my official apprentice, so I teach him all these things, including paper making. He's just so crazy about it, so I'm happy I'm I teach uh, leather embossing, just a little bit it on the cover of the book. I do it, you could do it on a massive piece of leather. Um, I usually do this with, uh, with students apart, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. I do marble paper. Have you ever seen marble paper? Yeah. Yeah, marble paper is usually used in covers here and in hand paper. Mm -hmm. so, you put paint in water? Yeah, I put paint in water and then mm -hmm. it's actually a very complicated process, but it's very enjoyable. I um, I have to brush the paper with alum. Water. And I have to use carrageen, which is a liquid from seaweed. Uh, mm -hmm. So I need to powder and I just heat it up in water and then I just use it. And I put a lot of um, paint, paint drops on, on the water and then the carrageen helps the paint float, never mix. And I just take a piece of paper and I just put it on the surface of the water and I raise it. And it gets like this. Yeah. It's an old trade that doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, I do classes on geometry. Uh, that's what we'll be doing today. I'll show you one how to construct a pattern today. Um, I think this are limited to maximum 20. So I only have 20 tools, 20 compasses. Oh yeah. So I, I realized that uh, when I was doing, my first workshop was about brass etching, so geometry, composite ruler and geometry on brass. And I realized that the market needed something else, and I realized also that some people don't want to do any hard job with banging the hammer, so they wanted to do something very soft. So I transferred the patterns from um, brass and leather to simply paper. And then some of the patterns you see in all around the place in here. Oh, I don't have to invent anything, it's already there. Um, and I teach embroidery, the same patterns. If you know how to do it on paper, you could do it on anything else. It's very simple. Um, as you can see, everything I do is visual, and everything I do is handmade. Uh, um, do you want me to comment on the, the people who do the workshops? Um, 
Well, I'm promoting Montrose for everyone, as I said. Um, and I realize that m mostly foreigners do the work. And I was wondering why, and the reason why is, I think Moroccans, in general, would be very happy to do a workshop on how iPhone is made, rather than on how a tray is made. Simply because we grew up with traditional life. It's very normalized in our life. It's taken for granted, and I don't blame that. Really. I, the same for me, like uh, many things I take for granted. Um, uh, but then at hands, I realized that people who lost connection with crafts and hands have more appreciation to, uh, to, this, to my world, to my business, to my offering. Therefore, I was like, okay, they're welcome to join in, and just, the, the majority are foreigners. So. I do have Moroccans who do workshops, um, but the majority are, are foreigners. Uh, now, can you share with us how did you build craft art that we know today? What was the process? Do you know how to build craft that you know today? <laughs> uh, okay, so um, I just realized that I just looked around around me, you know, just like maybe riding us off five meters around, and I just realized that I have someone in family, my father, who has knowledge in this class and I can just learn from him. Um, I don't have to, didn't have to pay anything, fortunately. Uh, so I, I just learned from my father and I, with experience um, in social business and in culture, I just realized that there is a business, a business, um, a need in the market. Um, of course, I'm, I'm so much aware of needs and wants. I, mean, I need food, I want pizza. People don't need to do these workshops because they don't need it. You rather buy the money it puts in this workshop. You rather buy milk. That will be more useful to your body than, than making a tray or a book. Um, but um, people have uh, cultural needs, and I um, and I and I don't, that's my market. So. so when I started, I learned from my dad, and I um, I needed a studio, and I just took his own studio since he was 17. Um, it's in uh, It's not far from Marseille. Just by the river and the beaches. Um, so I just revived that place because it was closed for thousands of years. I just opened it again and then used the same tool. I didn't have to buy it. My little investment financially had to do only with uh, the decoration and getting new seats and stuff. But everything I did in the studio was handmade. So this is how it started. Um, I had no idea how I could teach someone. Therefore, the idea I had in the very beginning is to recruit craftsmen and masters to actually do these workshops, not me. Um, so I was picking them, and I started with my very father. And I, I thought my father could actually teach the craft. If you work with someone who's been in the trade for 60 years, it would work with other masters. Um, then I realized that most of the masters I wanted to recruit didn't really want to do it because the training. They had, their training was TOT, training of trainers. They were trained to train, of course. But they can take you um, for 10 years and make sure you become a master. They, they were very direct with me and they told me, we have no idea how to teach Mr. Anybody, uh, or Madam Anybody, how to make something from scratch in three to four hours. It's very impossible. We can't teach that. So this was their belief. And I, at that time, I totally agreed with them. And I just... For about two years, I had to experiment on how to teach anybody how to make something from scratch. For really about two years. I started in 2013, and in 2015, I actually started to work. My workshop was, used to be a better, if you wanted to, to do this, it would take you a whole day. What I had in mind is a 10 year series of uh, two years in apprenticeship. And I, I had to write it down and I had to find out how it was done and how I can shorten that to um, what we could call a mass cafe culture. Because um, any, many things we do in modern, in modern times is really mass cafe culture. I mean, to build a house like this, um, you have to get sand the line and get the grass for two months before you start building the bricks and stuff. But with concrete and water, you could. You can easily make your, your, your building happen. Anyways, um, in traditional apprenticeship, the very first thing that kids would do, um, which was about two years, is just watching, enjoying, learning names of tools and learning how to navigate in the video. The second two years is finding the center with this compass. 
finding the sun. You won't be able to do anything if you can't learn how to find the sun. Finding the sun is the very first thing. After that, they would learn how to do circles, connect the geometry, and there, then they're given the opportunity to use tools to carve edge if boss stamp into anything. Um, so I just took these. I, I would say this is my Coca-Cola secret problem. Um, which took me about two years to find uh, out, and um, so I just shortened the whole ten years of apprenticeship to a series of three hours to four hours workshops. Um, the reason why I can, again, why I can, couldn't recruit the masters is because there was also a game of ego. It was very impossible for them. But me as a young young boy, also them, I would actually um, teach them how to teach crafts, and they've been doing it for six years. I mean, at least those are still alive. Um, hence, I decided I should do it myself. And in those two years, I realized how to do it. And I started experimenting. My work of was free. I was just having friends to come to the studio and just experimenting until I found the secret formula and then with time, I just realized I had some, I had built some confidence in having me come to the studio and make something now from one hour and a half to four hours, depending on how, how long you want to spend. If you want to spend two months, you could learn lots of things in two months. If you want to, uh, if you want to learn uh, things in weekend, I can offer you a weekend program. Yeah. So this is how I started. Yeah. Was uh, the money from for you? No, I, I re because I the. If I didn't have the tools in the space, particularly the tools, I would have needed lots of money. I had the tools. I mean, these conferences, those tools, you know, the thousand three hundred tools, they cost a lot of money. You could be at least one of them, at least two hundred dirhams each. So they were already there. They were gonna. You know, my dad just kept collecting them throughout his life, and I just had them ready made. So I just looked around and said, "What's around me? What, what can I use?" Um, and at the same time, I could do something good for for my society by bring in the crafts um, and people together. Um, again, I'm not assuming I'm preserving any crafts because people who learn with me are not going to be professional craftsmen. But I'm focusing on the knowledge system. Um, mm. uh, nowadays, we, we always saw about social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship is like something new that everyone is doing, uh, but everyone is criticizing that we don't have the ecosystem, we don't have uh, the money sometimes, if they are not interested. We started where social entrepreneurship wasn't as much known as now. Uh, so what was the keys? What, what is the secret? Well, I was very lucky. I studied social entrepreneurship in 2010, mm -hmm. between 2010 and 2015. I was doing trainers or social business. Here in Morocco, here in Fast universities, associations, places. And just that amount of workshops I was doing gave me an idea how we could start a business. Although it was it was in my time it was very theoretical. A few models to consider. We would always mention models from from outside Morocco. And it just didn't feel right to me. That come on, this is I mean I'm, I speak English now because of the reason, but I would be happy if I was speaking the region. But, but, but that was the feeling I had when I was doing the workshops. And whenever I wanted to give an example of a social business, I would find myself giving a model from America or anything. I was like, yeah, we do have something. So I was really fed up with the blah blah part of, of the training, um, the theory of politics. So I decided to do my own thing. So, um, it's very challenging, indeed, as you said, because at that time, um, just, even now, I would say that even 2013, um, people still don't understand what social entrepreneurship is. And we shouldn't really force them to understand it. Because, it, again, it's, it's not the end of the world if somebody doesn't know. But when I used to do the workshops, people would come and ask me, You keep speaking about these things for years, I've never seen any social entrepreneur. And I always answered in this way um, Raise your hand if you don't have a car, if you don't have a car. Who doesn't have a car? Okay. Raise your hand if you know what car insurance is. Mm 
well, you don't have a car, but you'd like me to understand what's car insurance. So my idea was, I want people to understand social entrepreneurship without having social diseases. Um, you don't have a car, therefore you're not a social entrepreneur, you're not engaged with social entrepreneurship, but you understand what's, what's a car and what's a... We haven't reached a, a level yet to create entrepreneurs because we haven't created a general public who understands what's, what's the concept. So uh, my fight and with other friends of mine at the time was just to let people understand what's car insurance before we tell them, oh, this is the car. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. And so but that was very helpful. Um, I, and I, I used to do lots of exercises and I did myself training, people trained me, so I, I went through lots of um, imaginative situations when you have to do your own business. Um, and one of them would be something like this. If you are invited to go to another century, some of the let's say you're going to the fifth century, and I ask you, take something from now, that could change the world at that time. What would you take? Whenever, should I ask this question now? Would you like to give me some answers? What would you take if you go to the 10th century, for example? In first, let's say in first. 10th century in first. Take something from here that would make people's life full. A phone. No. Alright. <coughs> why a phone? This is the first idea we have. First idea is a phone. Yes. Why, why a phone? I think it's. Uh... It's important, like, uh, we can't live without now, and it will uh, be very useful at this time, mm. in the 5th century, I think. Oh, okay. So to prevent, uh, preventing, uh, communicate easily and to prevent the uh, like, yeah. 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 Alright, so based on the, on the circumstances of the 10th century, I mean, we could do an intensive research about what life was in. Century. But apparently in the 10th century, if you tell someone, you've been recognized and I'll be first and I can speak to you, you're God at that time, maybe. Because you're a your prophet or... You could be worshipped or you could be killed. Thing. Two consequences. Um, the other thing is, is the idea of the phone in the 10th century. How would, if you're able to explain it to the people at the time, would you be able to make it? Because to invent a phone at the time, I mean, the reason why phone was invented is because there are lots of things, you know, mm -hmm. the layer upper layer of inventions, yes. so people could have could invent a phone. So you have to, you, you would have to invent plastic, you would have to invent uh, rubber, you would have to invent satellite, you would have to send an entire satellite to the cosmos for someone to actually do that. Uh, um, and you don't want to do that as, as a businessman and a businesswoman in, in the 10th century. You don't want to do that, it's a, it's a big capital. So you really want to introduce something at that time which is very, you know, um, not time consuming and money consuming. You know, so let's, let's avoid the phone. Well. It's a brilliant idea. But I'm just afraid it will be worshipped at that time. Which is good. You've got this. Um, uh, yeah, and any ideas going to take with you to the time century? Something very simple. So you can make it. What was that? A pan. Oh yes, pan is, is very. Would you know how to make a pan yourself? If it has this little tiny um, black chalk in the middle, and it's surrounded by wood. It's it's a very tough engineering um, process. Um, but it's doable. It's doable. You could take also a concept, it doesn't really have to be an item, it could be a concept, like how to cross the road, you know, the traffic lights, it could be something like that, uh, an idea. But in, in, in the workshops throughout the years, we realized that one of the best, best business products you could produce back in the time could be something like snake clippers. You could fun. That would save life at the time because people died because of that, as simple as that. Regardless, you don't want to take a phone, you just want to take that. Because people would, people lost toes, just because they couldn't. Uh, um, many things, how to shave, many things. But people die because of details that we enjoy nowadays. And the whole thing is, there are many things that we enjoy every day that we have no idea how they are made. We have no idea if we run out of them, how we will survive without them. Including lights. Um, um, 
So, in general, I was putting myself in this situation, like, this is 21st century, that was 2013, how can I introduce something to the crowd? That's very simple, I don't have to invent anything from scratch, something that's already there, and I just realized, oh, knowledge chaucer. And I was like, knowledge chaucer, why would I do knowledge chaucer? Because nobody was doing knowledge chaucer at that time. Um, of course, it was happening between fathers and sons, but in private, but no one is doing it to the general public, to anyone. So I thought this would be my market. And with time I realized the reason why I have uh, foreigners coming is generally in tourism when um, the average nights that people would spend in fast would be two nights. They would book a guy, do a tour, buy a carpet for 6,000 grams, tiny carpet, flying carpet, um, and they go home. They would never do anything interesting. Then I realized that tourists would come in because um, they would be able to make something from scratch. And I framed all my prices around what you're likely to buy as, a, as an average um, middle class tourist. Um, for example, um, average tourists would spend about between 200 dirhams to 500 dirhams in buying something. And so my prices are around that. The only thing that you offer me is time. Because you, you could buy this book in five seconds. Just hand money, take your book and you leave. But if you sit down with the same amount of money you could spend on this, if you can sit down and give me three hours of your entire life, you make it yourself. And you leave with something you made yourself. So your relationship with the item would be quite different. And for me, I would have succeeded in making some little steps in knowledge. Yes, yeah, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, my last question, but after they will have their questions, uh, what, what are your future plans? Well, I had, in the past, I had future plans, and now I have other future plans. Yeah. I mean, when I started the business, the future plans was to have crowd draft, mechanized crowd draft, ship down, crowd draft, market, crowd draft. You know, just focus on the local craft and do the same business model. And because I could recruit, recruit the masses, I can't split myself in different places. Yeah. So my decision was just to have it as a small studio and I'm happy to do it forever. Um, the next, next step is... Um, um, actually, it's, it's the same idea. I don't really have any specific things. It's the same idea. I just want to be as simple as possible. Uh, because I... For me, I could measure the impact of what I'm doing. Um, the moment when I decided to become very small and tiny and just even my legal structure, which is all about funnel, doesn't allow me to recruit anyone. Yeah. So it's it's encouraging me to stay small for the moment. Um, and I'm yeah, I'm just I'm very able to measure my impact with people. Yeah. So about the two thousand people I did the workshop with, I know there are two thousand trays or two thousand books or and I'm kind of able to control the quality of the workshop. I'm just afraid if I recruit someone to teach those workshops, the quality might go very, very bad. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe my answer is I don't know what to do. Okay. Yeah. That's it. But I'm planning to stay in class and do the workshop in the same conduct. So. Hopefully when I do 70 years old, I will still be doing the workshop. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, any, any yes. questions? Yeah. <laughs> any questions? Should we, we, should we keep an eye on, on the watch because yes. we still have to do a workshop? Yeah, no worries. Six, all right, so let's we need to start with the workshop in about maximum 20 minutes. Uh, 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank Généralement, les artisans qui veulent faire les smartphones, ils ne sont pas très bien. Je pense que c'est ça. Parce que, qu'est-ce que nous, 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 nous
Mais j'ai besoin de partager. Ils ne veulent pas partager. J'ai eu des problèmes. Le euh, partage de la connaissance, le partage de l'air, c'est ma amie à nous. Et là, c'est quoi ce que tu fais سمعي قالوا لي هذه الاثار ديال الحرفه ما خاصهمش يتصاحبوا ولكن هذه الفكره فقط تكون اللي تيقول مثلا غادي نعلمك وغادي تولي منافس نتاعي في السوق تما هذاك السر راه ولي مشكله بالنسبه لي حتى اللي خصو تولي باش تحاربني به ولكن اش لاحظتوا باللي انا هاد الناس اللي كيتكلموا عندي بقات يولي باش تصنعي دي بارتيكولي اي تمشيو بحالهم ما عندوش مشكل ولكن شكون اللي كي زعما شكون اللي كيضمن لك باللي بحال دابا هذاك السيد اللي معاك دابا اكتوالمون في فرونسي دو موا مو هو معاه شكون اللي ما يضمنلكش باللي زعما هادي مشات لنا فرونسا يدير لا فيديو ديالو يقدر يمشي لنفسك اللي لي كونكيرون ديالو واخا هي صار البروبليم الا الا هو عمل نفس القضيه في فرنسا كيفرحني الا كان يعطيك مثلا الصناعات اللي كيمشي في فرنسا هذا هو الغايه من الموديل ديال كارتا ولا يكون تغابليك ولكن واحد الحاجه انا ما خايفش لان عندي ذاك 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 الباودر اللي قلت لك تاع كوكا كولا ما خايفش منها لان انا عارفه تخدمت لي عامين وانا تنفتش عليها وما تنظنش غادي زعما يقدر شي واحد يربح حاجه حيت كاين دابا كاينين مثلا هنا في السوق كاينين اللي كيعملوا نفس القضيه كاين السياح اللي كانوا كيمشيو على الاجونس كيراجعوا مثلا اتوليو كيتعلموا شي حاجه من الزريج ولا الخشب ولا اللي كان ولكن انا عارف راسي كان تنعطي برودوي زعما لان لي زاتوري ديالي كيبداو بهذا الدب كيبداو بالكمبيوتر بالبلو سونس عاد تبدا لي زات انا عارف لي زات ديالي اخرين تبداو تاني تبداو ديجا تبداو قرر يسالي ولا سمع من خدام و كيجيك تجلس شوف واحد التكيكه هكا وصافي انا كنت تشوف تزعم بها مع كثير ما واحد الحيه انا ما خايفش هاد الساعه واخا هي الكومبيتيسيون مزيانه المنافسه مزيانه ولكن ما خايفش على انا زعما الخاصيه ديال عطيتو السر الحرفه وغادي ما تنضرش ما تنضرش كان هضرت مع المصنعيه بزاف وقالوا لي نفس الهضره اكتشفنا باللي ما تنضرش لان واحد التراكمات ديال الناعون ديال التوز وداك الشيء اللي ما يكونش يكون عندنا ولي نقل الموديل الله يسخر وانا كانت عندي واحد من التعلمات كنت تقرا عندي في استراليا دابا كنت تقرا على سكراب شوفت في استراليا ولكن خدات الاذن ديالي قلت لها على بالك هي بعيد كتحاولي عاوتاني تحلي بحالها في كانت في استراليا تخي بيان سي سي فريمون لو لوكا راه في ميدو اللي كتدير ديكشي ديالها واخا واخا كتكون كتقرا نفس الشكل هكا ولكن عندها الناعم ديالها جيد قديم ماشي بحال اللي عندي هنايا كيجيوني عندي الناس اللي كيصوبو البيعو هنا يفاس يعني وقفت على شي حاجه كنجيبو تما في استراليا فاش كتربط فيا على هذا كتجي كتحط في اختيار 20 درهم باش كي تاخد هذا ب 150 درهم كتجي عندي كتجمع الناعم وكتمشي ليك المول ولكن تنضرش المشكله En tout cas, on, je, euh, je vous félicite pour le travail que vous faites, c'est vraiment impressionnant. Zaman, vous êtes encore jeune et vous avez eu l'idée de conserver quelque chose. Zaman, d'achel d'il fait et en faire euh, tout ça, Zaman, de l'entrepreneuriat, les naissent avec tous leurs études ou le background de l'homme. Zaman, malgré ça, une idée, il va ou là qui va chercher quelque chose, il est tombé. Zaman, déjà de travailler deux ans ou là quatre ans sur la même idée et ne pas laisser tomber. Sachant que vous êtes encore jeune au Lexi, c'est impressionnant, je vous félicite. Ça fait plaisir. 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 Ça fait Oh, in fact, one of my brothers wanted to work with me, but then he had to leave the country in trouble. Uh, he, he could ask me if I if I could convince him with what I'm doing, more or less, because to have him come and do it. Uh, I think what I'm doing, anyone can do it, um, but I just, um, 
the experience I had would make a difference, and their experience would make a difference. But my my answer could be I could convince my father to do it again, because it was a time when he actually stopped doing it. Um, because of the general idea that crafts are dying, and um, yeah, so I yeah. I would love my brothers to do it, but I don't think they're interested now. Um, they did it for years, but I don't think they're interested because they have another career now, which is very uncrafty. But, sorry, I forgive them. Um, hey, thank you for being here. Um, I'm a Moroccan, I've already taken the workshop, and I'm sure we work in other two um, my question is, so do you think that at some point you will have to read that to a business model on the same thing as well? Do you think you will have to read that to a business model to a larger structure once the business model is? Yes. Well, I, I, I would say it's already growing, and sometimes my structure that cannot really satisfy the demand. Especially sometimes if we say tourists in Christmas time, I will be working from 8 to 8, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Workshops, groups, I would get so tired. Um, if I had someone, I would, I would, I would do... Um, yes, if I, if I have to grow, I would have... First thing I have to do, I have to train people to who to train. Because my way of training is very different, and you've done it. So you know how it happens. Um, but part of the workshop is also the discussion and the history and stories of crafts and masters and apprentices. So if I am ever changing my, enlarging my structure, I have to find the right person there. Because the organizational structure is very normal, I mean, it's very easy to, to enlarge. But the human resource, that's, that's the, that would be my difficulty, I guess. But again, to answer your question, yes. Last question, and then we go on to the workshop. Uh, it's mine. No questions. If no one has questions, of course. Will you teach this to your son or daughter? Okay. You can ask the mama. <laughs> no, no. We are, we will. Yeah. I will. We will. Yeah. Is it uh, something to live with, or just uh, something to do and to add that on? No, I will certainly, I'll make sure that my kids will, when they're about 15 or 18, I want them to be able to learn to make, to make these things for scratch. By the time they're 18, they need to be able to make things. And then it's really up to them if they want to do it. Yeah. They're welcome to do it. Mm -hmm. But I, I have, feel I have a duty to pass it to my very kids. And then. I think also it's about the ideology as much as it is about the actual. But for us anyway, education in the crafts is about how you can connect your mind to your hands and to your soul. It's not like education in schools these days is just about the mind. Yeah. It's training the mind and it's training um, how you can use your intellect, but your intellect isn't, doesn't act on its own. So when you learn crafts, you learn how to connect your hands to your heart, to your head. And for us, I think that's what we would want our kids to learn. And regardless of what they do for a career, it's about connecting because it's helpful for you to understand yourself, understand the society, and. Um, How do you think if you look at it this way? You have a, a son or a daughter, and then you send them to play karate, right? By the time they're 18, they're so great at kicking and punching. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the same idea that was happening in traditional Morocco. You send your kids to your craft studio every summer, every school break, everything. It was very long. And that's actually when the, that was the beginning of the entrepreneurial spirit. When I remember when I was a child, I would sell, you know, sweets and biscuits when I was in the neighborhood. And many people did that with their kids. And um, maybe some of you sold bakok or something like that when you were kids. Mm -hmm. Or acai or something like that. Was, yeah. But that's, that's the beauty of Morocco is we were teaching kids, giving them the entrepreneurial spirit at an early age. Which we don't actually, you won't get that anymore. Yeah, we don't, we don't get that from school, but we get it from family. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we are all children. Thank you. Hey, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm 
Kenzo, thank you so much, Kenzo, the founder and the craftsman of crafts and drafts. Thank you so much again. Thank you.